God, we have just sung that you are for us and that you are with us. And we hold to that um, truth in these days where we uh, walk and, um, and struggle and go through our daily lives. God, as we sing these songs, uh, we don't sing them alone. We sing them with those in the room, but we also are singing them with your people throughout the generations. We recognize that, that these truths have been proclaimed for thousands of years. Your love is endless and all-encompassing. Um, your spirit is present in the world uh, for our good. God, as we come to uh, this text today, would you draw us closer to yourself? Would you show us who we are as your people, as your disciples, Jesus? May we find ourselves aligning with you. Amen. So I invite you to picture yourself walking downtown in a big city like Toronto or Manhattan. Block after block of tall buildings and all sorts of stores and restaurants and businesses and banks, corporations and billboards and lights and traffic and people. It's dark outside and you're walking along making your way to a pizza place that your friends recommended. And you come upon this swanky five-star restaurant with high ceilings and a large window, large windows facing the street. Um, their chandeliers are what catch your eye first. They're amazing. And the entrance boasts these massive wooden doors, and there's these two doormen in tuxedos standing outside. You notice a crowd of people standing outside, looking in the windows and talking in low voices. They look indignant and hungry and very well-dressed, like we're talking suits and ties and these gorgeous dresses and really expensive shoes and handbags, all of those things by top designers, you know, um, all those things that we wear, right? No, just kidding. Uh, they're obviously some of the elite in this city. Some of them are probably even celebrities, and they want in. You hear them muttering, they wouldn't let me in. They literally went out in the street and asked who hadn't eaten yet today. You peer through the crowd to see what they're looking at and what you see surprises you. The people eating at the tables are not clean or well-dressed. In fact, their clothes are pretty ragged and some of them aren't even wearing shoes. On the floor next to many of their chairs are dirty backpacks and you even notice a few shopping carts full of uh, belongings parked against the far wall. They're eating decadent, beautifully plated food and drinking wine and carrying on quiet conversation at their tables. Waiters and waitresses go from table to table with wine and bread, asking what more they can offer their guests. Suddenly, you see someone walk in from the back and extend his hands and address the whole room. He's well-dressed, well-kept, but not in a pretentious sort of way. Everyone looks up when he speaks, and they smile and sort of chuckle in unison. Some nod their heads, and a few others wipe their eyes. They look grateful. And then they go back to eating while the man walks around from table to table with a pitcher of water, making conversation with whoever welcomes it. What is this place, you wonder? Obviously, these people can't pay for their meal. And by the looks on the faces of those standing outside, they were expecting to eat here tonight. Something's going on. Your curiosity gets the best of you. So you make your way around the building to the back of the restaurant, hoping to encounter one of the serving staff or the cooks. And what do you know? 
It's the man himself, the owner, perhaps, swinging a garbage bag into the bin. Sir, you say, I noticed the crowd outside first, and then I looked in at your guests. And I'd like to know what it takes to get a seat at one of your tables tonight. And he looks at you and simply says, you have to need it. This is how Jesus starts his Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for justice, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Did you picture the guests at the restaurant? They represent the poor in spirit, those who are mourning, the meek, those hungering and thirsting for justice, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers and the persecuted. It was the ones who admitted their poverty that received the blessing of that incredible meal. If we could sum up in one sentence what Jesus is saying in the Beatitudes, the very beginning of his sermon, it might be this. To get a seat at the table, you have to need it. The table has been an image that we've used in the last number of months to describe God's kingdom, what God is bringing into the world through Jesus. This is a kingdom that will be marked by love and justice and peace generosity and abundance. Everyone will have enough. There will be no hierarchy. Each person will be given dignity and respect, and the most vulnerable will be cared for. In God's kingdom, where God reigns as king, every single person will flourish. All of creation, actually, will flourish. So Matthew has Jesus announcing that this kingdom is on its way, and he's pointing out that Jesus is the one who's initiating it by what he says and what he does, and that God has actually been planning this all along. The blessings, the Beatitudes, at the beginning of Jesus' sermon point to it, and they're describing who's part of it. And guess what? (laughs) They're not the kind of people the world says is blessed. Isn't that funny? The world says things like, blessed are the rich, right? Blessed are the powerful. Blessed are those who keep the best for themselves. And blessed are the comfortable. Blessed are those who are hungering and thirsting for all the pleasures that this world has to offer. That's what the world's saying. And Jesus, in the first part of his sermon, turns this on its head. So I want to break this down for us. It's interesting. There are three things I think that each blessing points to. First, who it is that receives the blessing. Second, what the blessing is. And the third is implied. It's those who don't receive it. So I made slides. Uh, I apologize to those of you watching. Um, It looks to me like you won't be able to see that. So my apologies. If you follow along in your your Bibles, um, I'm reading from Matthew 5, the beginning of Matthew 5. So, is this on here already? You can see that. Maybe I should have made it bigger. I'll learn. Um, blessed are is kind of the, the overarching, overarching thing, right? So we start with blessed are the poor in spirit. So this poverty that Jesus is talking about is not just socioeconomic poverty. Um, we get this from the way that the word poor is used throughout the Old Testament. It is a posture. It's an attitude of dependence and humility. It's honestly admitting our needs and our vulnerability and our powerlessness and our limitedness. It's coming to God with empty and open hands. That's the poor in spirit. 
I paired that with, uh, or contrasted that with, the self-sufficient. Uh, the self-sufficient are in control, right? They are living in the illusion that they have everything in control and that they need to have everything in control. Um, that's not who's blessed. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, what does this mean? Well, Jesus says at one point, a little bit later in Matthew, that the kingdom of God belongs to children, and that whoever doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child, so like in that posture of trust and dependence, um, they don't enter it. Of course, the kingdom, like I mentioned before, this is God's space. This is where God reigns, and sin and evil don't reign. It's kind of like um, what's going to happen in the future, but what's already started in the present through Jesus. Um, So our second slide. Let's see if I can... There we go. Oh, that worked nice. Um, Those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. This is a posture, too. It's a willingness to lament, a willingness to grieve losses and the grieving of those losses. This is what I thought on the way here, actually. Those who are mourning, and we're going to see this again, um, this is about acknowledging that all is not right in the world. Um, It's acknowledging the ways that people and we ourselves are wounded. Uh, It's facing our sin the fact that we participate in what's not right in the world. Um, Mourning is sitting with that for a while and acknowledging even that this is why Jesus had to die. Uh, It's grieving with others and the world. And the contrast to that is those who don't have a reason to mourn. Um, I was thinking, like, this is about denial and dismissal of, of those hard things. The fact that not everything is right in the world. Um, sometimes we do this by avoidance. Sometimes we do it by numbing, uh, especially when it's not our own pain. But Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And you get this picture of a child being comforted by their parent. Um, the comfort that God is offering is not only in the present moment. It's also the fact that at some point, God will destroy sin and death, and he will wipe away every tear. Uh, That is hopeful to me. (laughs) The fact that someday everything will be right (laughs) in creation and in the world somehow um, through what Jesus has done. Here's the next one. Blessed are the meek. This is a posture of humility and gentleness and dependence on God. So that same picture is the poor in spirit, the empty and open hands. And this is contrasted with, I use the word entitled, but we could also slide the proud in there, people that walk around with a lot of pride. We could slide privileged in there. Uh, That's an uncomfortable word uh, because we live in that space, right? Quite a bit, actually. Um, Instead of being meek, uh, we think we're better than someone or superior to them, uh, that we deserve something good and someone else doesn't. Um, That's that sense of entitlement. And Jesus turns that on its head and he says, No, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the land. This is a picture, actually, of Israel in the Promised Land. So if you go back to what we've been in in Deuteronomy and the Exodus and Numbers narratives from last fall, um, here's Jesus up on a mountain, and he is sort of like, this is the picture, handing a new covenant to God's people, just like Moses handed Israel that first covenant at Mount Sinai. The first covenant was the ethic God was handing to his people, and he handed it to them along with these promises that he would give them land and multiply them and that they would be his people and he would be their God. So, so this inherit the land is that picture of Israel, but Jesus is handing it to his disciples now, somehow. And it's, it's, an, uh, it's an analogy, right? I think he's pointing to the kingdom again. So in the first one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. This is another picture of that. 
He's saying, this is what's going to happen in my land, uh, the land that I'm giving you. This is how you're going to show the world who I am. Uh, blessed are the meek. The land will belong to the meek, hmm. to the humble. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for justice. It's this, it's, you can get both words um, through the Greek and the Hebrew. Um, what these people want, these people that are hungry for justice, for righteousness, they want uh, what is good and right for all people. This is that longing for freedom from evil and sin, and that's for ourselves and for the whole world. It is describing those who long for a right relationship with God and others and who are longing for the kingdom to come in its fullness. I contrasted that with those who hunger and thirst for self-satisfaction. What they want most is to be comfortable, no matter what it costs, <laughs> no matter um, who it affects. And Jesus says, no, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. Oh, that feeling of satisfaction, um, it, it describes this inner peace, right? Not wanting for anything. Here's the next. Blessed are the merciful, those extending forgiveness and compassion and grace and who aren't keeping a record of wrongs, keeping tally of what you did to me and, and, and how I deserve um, what I deserve. The contrast is the unmerciful. Uh, it's those who aren't merciful, who are keeping a record of wrong, who are retaliating and paying back for things that others have done to them, who are vindictive and on the defensive, who are not compassionate, who are not extending grace. And Jesus says, no, it's the merciful. They shall receive mercy. I was thinking about this, and I wondered if it was more, instead of, um, it's not a, uh, I'm trying to think of how to put it, uh, so you do this, and then you get this kind of um, idea. I was thinking it's more like maybe the merciful can't actually receive mercy for themselves because their hands are like this, their fists are tight. Receiving mercy takes this kind of humility. It takes admitting your own part of what is wrong. Um, it's admitting your own need. If you can't extend mercy to others, <laughs> you can't receive it either. Blessed are the pure in heart. This describes people who are sincere and who have integrity and who are honest, who are telling the truth. And the contrast is the deceitful, dishonest, hypocritical, impure motives, insincere, insincerity. All of those things are wrapped into that. And Jesus says, no, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Um, Psalm 24 gives us a picture of this. Um, the question that the, that the psalmist poses is, who is going to be with God in his sanctuary? Who's going to see the king of glory? And he says, those with clean hands and pure hearts, who do not give their souls to what is false or speak deceitfully. How can we be with God and be hiding those kinds of things? We can't. This is about unclouded eyes, being open and aware and not hiding. And, and maybe this seeing God for us right now, because we're not seeing him with our eyes, maybe this seeing God is seeing where God is at work, seeing God in and through one another. And then the promise is that someday we will see him face to face. Two more. <clears throat> Blessed are the peacemakers. These are, actively, these are people actively seeking peace, right, and reconciliation, pursuing shalom, which is kind of this sense of wholeness and peace throughout the whole world, pursuing shalom in their relationships and in the world. And I, I, I contrasted it with uh, conflict contributors, um, those who start wars, uh, those who are retaliating, who are causing and supporting division, labeling and judging the other. Uh, prejudice could fit into that. 
um, those who are taking sides and villainizing others, um, those who are contributing to violence in some way. Uh, and Jesus says, no, the peacemakers are blessed. They shall be called God's children. They are the ones that are reflecting God, that are reflecting God's heart um, for this goodness to permeate the whole world. And then we have this one. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for justice. Obviously, something that these people are doing is going against what the majority culture is valuing and promoting. Uh, maybe it, their actions or inactions are actually confronting it. Maybe they're refusing to do something or defending someone or something. Um, it's direct opposition that these persecuted people are facing. And I paired this with pass, being, being passive and disengaged. Because obviously those people who are being persecuted for the sake of righteousness are somehow doing something or saying something that is confronting something evil that's going on in the world. And this passive and disengaged attitude, um, it would mean like self-focus and apathy and maybe willful ignorance or going along with the crowd, um, taking the easy road. A lot of times it's rooted in fear, right? And Jesus says, it's the persecuted who are blessed, for theirs is the kingdom. So here too, like the poor in spirit, the kingdom is where God reigns and evil and sin are defeated. Um, the kingdom is meant to be received with a posture of trust and dependence, remember? So Jesus is describing his disciples. Uh, he's talking to them. I didn't read this intro um, to his sermon yet. Matthew says this, Seeing the crowds, uh, it was those who were following him because he was doing all of those incredible things, showing um, what the kingdom is like, essentially, and proclaiming the good news of the God's kingdom. Seeing the crowds, he went up on a mountain, and when he sat down, we read, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Sitting down uh, is what, uh, to teach is what rabbis did in those days. Matthew is signaling to us that Jesus is a rabbi and that his disciples were those who came to him wanting to learn from him. So that's their posture. And then Jesus starts in with these eight blessings, and it's like he is all of a sudden preparing them for what's coming. He goes on after these first eight blessings to say this, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they treated the prophets who were before you. You are blessed when you align with me. When you're rejected or persecuted or reviled, when people speak evil against you because you're following me. He says, this is where I am. And yes, it is going to cost you something because it is confronting the values and the priorities of the world. But, he says, look ahead. Your reward is coming. Think back to our scene from the restaurant for a moment. These are the people who are blessed, and these are their blessings. Can you see that? Yeah, you can. The fact that Jesus starts his sermon here with these blessings, uh, these descriptions of people in the restaurant, sets the tone for the whole sermon. You look at this list, and it actually um, remarkably describes Jesus, uh, that list on the left there. It also describes his followers. It's like he's saying, this is you as much as it is me. These are who my followers are, and you'll look and act completely different from, the what, from those the world deems blessed. We're on the weak side, standing here among the poor and the grieving, among those longing for justice, for equity, for what is good, 
and right for all people. We're the ones acknowledging that not all is right in the world and that sometimes we're even a part of it. We're standing with the meek, admitting that we need help. We're the ones extending forgiveness and compassion. And yes, we are going to be labeled and judged and persecuted for these things. But this is where the real blessings are, friends, both now and when God's kingdom arrives in its fullness. These blessings point out what God wants for the world, what he's doing in the world through Jesus and through us, his disciples, until the time that evil will be destroyed forever. So if we're honest, uh, most of us deeply want the list on the right, right? Uh, I'll, read, I'll read some of them for you uh, online here. Theirs is the kingdom. They shall be comforted. They shall inherit the land. They shall be satisfied. They shall receive mercy. They shall see God. They shall even be called God's children. Theirs is the kingdom. That's where we want to be. And maybe we're actually a little uncomfortable with this list on the left, either because it doesn't describe us very well, or because it looks really hard, or because it means giving something up. Well, friends, I have good news for you. The theme running through most of that list on the left is getting honest and admitting our neediness, admitting our weakness and our sin and our dependence on God, recognizing that we can't do this on our own. It's like Jesus is saying we're blessed when we come to God with empty and open hands and when we follow him. This kind of humility, admitting our weakness, taking on this posture of an apprentice, a student of Jesus, That's what seems to be the prerequisite for for joining in with this kingdom and what God is doing through it, for following Jesus, joining him in what he's doing. So here's my question for you. Where are you? Are you in the restaurant or are you standing outside? Are you with Jesus these days or not? Like, are you in conversation with him? Do you want to learn from him? Are you turning back to him when you've turned away? Because we all do that. We all do it consistently. Being his disciples is not about getting it right all the time. Obviously, like, if you read the four Gospels, that is the the profound story of the disciples. (laughs) Um... They don't get it right all the time. We don't get it right all the time. There is room in this relationship to be one of little faith, to be weak, to be frustrated, to need help. And Jesus is saying that we are blessed when that's where we're at. Notice that I'm saying we. (laughs) That's because we actually do this together. Uh, We're doing it with Jesus, but we're also doing it um, together. And Jesus is inviting us into this space, uh, this open-handed, empty-handed space before God with him. Uh, And he's saying, let's be here together. Let's pray. God, may we... uh, sit with uh, these blessings in the coming days. May we not experience them as um, a moral to-do list. Uh, I don't think that's what Jesus was intending, what you were intending, Jesus. May we experience them as um, descriptions of who we are and what you're calling us to as your disciples. May we turn to you, Jesus, um, when we've turned away. May we recognize uh, our neediness, 
our dependence on you, our sin even. And may we find you merciful and gracious as you are. Jesus, we want to walk with you as your disciples. Teach us how to do that. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Part of being disciples of Jesus is practicing communion together, to coming to his table. So here is your invitation. Come to this ancient table, so full of mystery, yet profoundly tangible. Here we see and touch and taste the fruit of earth and vine, and by these gifts, Christ makes himself known to us. This is the table not merely of the church, but of Christ. It's made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, whether you have much faith or little, have tried to follow him or are afraid you've failed. Come because it's his will that those who want to meet him might meet him here. The Gospels tell us that on the first day of the week, the day our Lord rose from the dead, he appeared to some of his disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of bread. This is true for us as well. Christ is made known to us as we break this bread and drink this cup together. The Apostle Paul tells us that on the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul then reminds us that whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of Christ until he comes again. So I invite you to repeat this after me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, blessed forever. To you be praise and honor for giving yourself, shedding your blood, and letting your body be broken in death for our sake, so that we might have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Bless, O oh God, this bread which we together eat, and this cup which we together drink. Let us, through this bread and this cup, become partakers of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Unite us with one another and with all your saints, in heaven and on earth. Consecrate us, set us apart, body and soul, to be a living, acceptable offering to you, so that in word and deed, we may continually praise and glorify your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is food for the journey to which God has called us. It reminds us who we are. So let our lives be nourished by the Lord himself as we come together at this table. I invite you to come up um, to take a cup and to take a piece of bread. And then uh, just simply stand to the side, give yourself some space between you, especially between households. And eat and drink. Uh, let's eat and drink together. And then you can put your cup back um, on the table here. So I invite you to come. <laughs>